G'day guys, back with another instalment of On the Shoulders of Giants, where I, Jared Powell, have interesting conversations with interesting people. Today, I'm really excited and, and privileged to bring to you a conversation I had with Greg Lehman. Greg Lehman really needs no introduction. He's a Canadian physiotherapist and chiropractor. He has been the voice of a generation, I feel, in terms of many new graduate physios and chiros coming out in the past 15 to 20 years. He's often controversial, uh, but always very articulate in his views and he's somebody who I uh, look to for inspiration all the time. We had a varied conversation. The object of our discussion was to talk about pain and the nuances of pain and his interpretation of it and how he communicates to patients regarding pain but we, then we veer off and talk about a bunch of other things in terms of graded exposure, uh, loading, capacity and all of these things as well. I really hope you enjoyed today's discussion and without further ado I bring to you Greg Lehman. Okay here we are with Greg Lehman. I was just chatting off there a moment ago and I, I think Greg has been the voice of a generation, and it might sound a bit gratuitous because I'm talking to him here, but I really think that, uh, Greg, I'm, I'm 33, 34 years old, and I think that Greg has been the voice of us as we've gone through university over the last 10 years or so. So I want to thank you for that, Greg, and I also want to introduce you as well. Thanks for coming on and having a chat with me. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to it. Yeah, no problem. So. You're, you're quite interesting in your background. You've had a, as far as I'm aware, training in chiropractic and also physiotherapy. And you've also done some post-grad or master's work in spine, spine mechanics. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I did that first before the chiro and the physio. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. So I think that has you in a really unique sort of uh, position to have a very interesting voice on pain because you've got you've, you've seemingly got both sides of the coin covered in terms of biomechanics and then I know you are quite an advocate of the biopsychosocial approach to pain as well so could you just sort of speak to potentially how your interpretation of pain started when you were doing spine biomechanics and, and all of that and then we can sort of come to how it's evolved over the past 10, 15, 20 years or so? So uh, it's actually funny. It hasn't evolved much. <laughs> I didn't have to go <laughs> through any cosmic shifts like uh, other people did. I, I was actually introduced to the multi-dimensional nature of pain uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. So I, when I was in my undergrad, uh, just in kinesiology, I was reading John Sarno. Uh, I was reading about how posture influence mood i even asked to do like my thesis in that i that wasn't allowed uh that, that was too weird uh um but i know i wrote a paper on it in my during my masters in an ergonomics course i wrote a paper about like where the pain was coming from that was 1997 and i wrote about central sensitization uh i got into like more of nociception you know, like, like the pain fiber. So I was a little bit wrong there, but, but I, we still talked about how it's influenced by a number of factors. Um, the professors at the University of Waterloo at the time, so my supervisor was, was Stu McGill, but his, his supervisor decades before uh, was Bob Norman, uh, who was an occupational biomechanist. And, he, and they would go in and try to prevent injuries at a workplace, but they always talked about the psychosocial factors being a big driver of pain. And then one of my first papers was on spine manipulation uh, and in it we talk about how and we're wrong but we talked about how <laughs> uh, spine manipulation might influence central sensitization so I, I, I honestly i was pretty lucky lucky i would i would just go through bouts in my career where i probably like not necessarily overemphasized the biomechanics because i still think it, they're important but like i got it wrong how biomechanics was important so that, mm -hmm. that, that's only, that's, those are the shifts I've had, but I never had to be like, I had to change my view on how pain was multidimensional. That's, that's, no, that's, that's fascinating and, and contrary to 
probably a lot of people's experience over the last 10 to 15 years as well. Uh, certainly in my training, I psychosocial factors were, were glanced at in the last paragraph potentially of a, of a, of a case study that you looked at. Um, you, everything was about tissue irritability, strength testing, range of motion testing, all of these things. And then potentially if that didn't explain symptoms, then you looked at some other factors. So I'm fascinated that despite your heavy biomechanics training that you were exposed to that quite early. Why, why yeah. do you think that has potentially not gathered more momentum over the last 10 so, years? So that's always been my disappointment. Like, and so I would give lectures decades ago, like, gosh, uh, even in the year 2000, that's when I started lecturing. And I was quite young and I was a student at the Cairo College, but I was lecturing in the grad department, just the way it's set up. Um, I always found like all these biomechanical ideas could be challenged by biomechanics and people would just hold on. And people would, this is what I would say, like, no, no it doesn't work that way, that the SI joint is not out of position. Uh, C3 is not stuck on C4. There's no adhesions. There's no scar tissue. That's not why you have pain. You know, this is an active release technique jargon that we would hear in Cairo College. I'm like, none of these make sense. And so people would get pissed because be like, well, what the hell do we do then? Like people, there was like a vacuum, right? There's, there's like, well, well if, if none of these things are really valid, well, then how do I practice? And so that's why I think people held on because they had to do something and they were also helping people. So their explanations might be faulty. The reasoning could be dodgy, but they still help people. So that, that, that's why I think there, there hasn't been a massive impetus to change. And I would also mm -hmm. say, like, the, it's not like biopsychosocially informed interventions are, like, dramatically uh, outperforming ultrasound or back cracking or whatever in, in studies. That's, that, that's going to hold people back, too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That that's a great. That's actually a really good point because the effect sizes are are pretty small for, for exercise and similar to manual therapy and everything else. So, despite the fact it may be more accurate from a scientific perspective, results wise, it's it's not a slam dunk, really, is it? Yeah, it always it, it always disappoints to me. Like evidence based practitioners are so quick to like shit on things, and then they say do this instead, and I'm like. Where's the evidence for that? <laughs> like, it, like there, there's, a, there's a nice cl clinical review on patellofemoral pain and uh, they say, don't do ultrasounds. You know, it doesn't, you know, there's no evidence for it. It's, it and then what they mean is like, when you look at the ultrasound trials, they have a sham group. So both groups for knee pain, if they get, get ultrasound and one's sham and one's real, they'll have decreases in pain, like 30 to 50%. But the real ultrasound doesn't outperform the sham. So then they conclude, oh, it's all sham and placebo. But then they'll say, do exercise or change movement patterns and then, or do gait retraining. And then you go look at those studies and they recommend those things. But those studies never have a sham group, <laughs> right? Like they never have a good control group. And though, although those are the things that I do and I don't do ultrasound, I'm not defending it. I'm sort of like questioning how our thinking here. They... It's only because we can only recommend exercise or gait retraining um, because they don't the, the studies aren't as well controlled. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I mean maybe this they is, will outperform a sham, but who knows? Yeah. This is pure cognitive dissonance, isn't it? When you can believe two opposing things, and it's well on that. There's a there's a paper just come out a week or two ago, and I'm into into shoulders on exercise versus placebo or, or, or sort of non-exercise intervention uh, oh, really? systematic review for rotator cuff tendinopathy and the the result was pretty startling for an exercise advocate it's a clinically insignificant uh superior benefit for exercise versus non-exercise um or placebo so look very yeah. like there were three or four papers in view to, uh, included in the systematic review so more work to be done but interesting I know I hate it because I'm like you. That's my bias is gay retraining, exercise, you know, cognitive restructuring. And then mm. often it's not better. But you do. I mean, what everyone says, you know, we all say, well, there, maybe there's a subset. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I just think I think that just speaks more to 
individ like things work differently for different people at different times and it's really hard to scientifically capture all of that in these reviews and i'm not i'm not saying we shouldn't study it and, and be rigorous scientifically just think it's always going to be a similar outcome with these studies because everybody's different yeah that's i mean and and it's difficult because we people have been trying to subgroup for 20 years mm. and like doing classification and then they, those often don't uh, outperform because because yeah. you can't have subgroups. You can, but everyone's a subgroup of one. That's the. <laughs> yeah. But that could be tested. You could test tailored treatment to non-tailored. But I I actually believe, and this might piss people off, but like there are general things that all of us could recommend to our patients, and we're going to help out a massive number of people, and. And, and why I think therapists don't like it because we, we want to think that we're mechanics and we're diagnosing, diagnosing and we're precise and we've, mm. we've, we've figured out exactly what to do for this person. And, and general things, you know, it's, le it's less sexy. It's, not, it's simpler. But I, I think general good um, interventions can help a lot. But people hate that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then the non-specific kind of exercise really speaks to that in terms of the literature as well, doesn't it? It all works. And this is, there's, there's non-superiority over different exercise interventions, it seems, for a lot of conditions. And some people don't like that as well. And I, I can understand that. And also as, as physios, we, we want to, you know, use our intellectual faculties, our training in, in movement analysis and all of these things, right? We want to have these huge effects. But pragmatically probably as long as we're recommending a couple of different things stay active don't overthink it you know sleep all these sorts of things are we going to yeah. be helping people mainly from that perspective what do you think no that, that that's what i'm saying and i think that there's there's a small subset of people who we do need to tailor it to mm -hmm. uh like we start my course my fate my, my my favorite thing my, is me and my course my favorite thing <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I love this question. It says, like, when do we need to be specific? Right. That's how that's how we start my course. Like, and like, if, if, if it was 20 years ago and you're a mulligan practitioner, you'd be like, oh, a lot. You need to if, you know, C3 is not moving on C4 in this direction, you need to be very specific in your line of drive. If it's elbow pain, you have to specifically glide the radius laterally. You know, now people would be like, no, 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 you get symptom modified. But, but I still think there's probably times where if we could find out like um, principles of when you need specificity. So here's, mm -hmm. here's like an example. I, 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 everyone's listening. All right, what the hell do you mean? It, it would be something like this. Someone tears their ACL or someone has kneecap related pain. There's a subset of people who will um, unconsciously protect that knee and that knee becomes unloaded. They, if you, they do a squat and you look at them, they'll look symmetrical, but they're not loading the, the pained or the reconstructed knee the same amount. There's less stress on it. And you can't see it, right? So they're protecting that knee. So if that person, you know, wants to get back to sport, so high demands, they're able to like somehow modify their movement patterns to keep protecting it. So they'll never, you, would, you could argue, they'll never get enough of a stimulus during the activity the goal like running or squatting to challenge that need to catalyze it to make it like get stronger it'll always have that deficit now most people that's fine if they're not going back to a high demand sport but the person who has to go to the high demands they probably need specific kneecap quadricep strengthening that won't just come from running or playing the sports or what it, like tumbling or gymnastics. They'll need that specific exercise because they might get into the situation where they can't compensate and that weakness will show up and you actually need strength in that specific situation and then they get a re-injury. So there's like a small subset and that's probably why, and that might only be 4% of people where the vast majority of people will get lots of benefits from general stuff, but they're that 4%, five, I don't know, 8%. They need it and then that'll lead to re-injury. So that wouldn't show up in a research paper, but there's like the clinical reasoning. And I, and I, I, I think it'd be a really, sorry, I'm talking too much, a real, talking too much, a real cool research paper to find out what are those cases, right? So psychosocially, you might say, like we know that pain science education in general doesn't help, but there might be a subset of people where 
if you don't change that unhelpful um, unhelpful belief like that they have a rotator cuff tear and that and that means they have to protect it and then they'll just stop doing and they'll never get better unless they actually start to use their shoulder but they'll never use their shoulder unless you convince them that they're safe so you need you know pain science it's like you need to change your cognition so there might be like specific cases like that i don't know if research can ever go into that but i like the thought process yeah well kind of a little bit being proven in the shoulder with the importance of expectations and, and self-efficacy and all, and all this sort of stuff where you know we can maybe improve expectations via adequate and, and appropriate advice and education it, it, I, I totally agree with what you've what you've painted there as in ter- conceptually anyway in terms of biomechanics for sure matters and load tolerance and capacity and all these things that matters for a subset of people and the argument should never be that it doesn't matter it matters for certain people at certain times but for the vast majority where pain and function and just getting back into activities of daily living or or something like that it may not matter and it, it we can still yeah. pursue it we can still pursue it and this is really this is key and something that i'm researching a little bit at the moment is well, when we look at all the trials with, with shoulder pain, for example, actually, people don't get stronger in, in interventions in, in randomized controlled trials, but their pain and function dramatically improves. So what's the application of load or exercise doing there? It's doing something else. Yeah, that's, that's my other favorite question <laughs> is like, how does exercise actually mediate recovery? You know, when does, does strength matter? And I think strength, for the most part, is just a byproduct. It's an epiphenomenon. It's a, it's a side effect that doesn't drive the most clinical uh, improvements. It just pra- happens if it does happen, and it, it, it's secondary. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, but strength training in and of itself is helpful, but you just don't need to get stronger. Strength, strength is emergent, much like, much like consciousness and all of these things potentially when you do, when you undergo a rehabilitation regime which yeah yeah go on i, I was just going to say that some people again don't like that because our our history is find a weakness and impairment correct it and they get better and and i and so they argue oh you need to build hip strength and and i would say you don't need to be weak to benefit from hip strength training if you have low back pain or knee pain right the pain is the reason to do the hip strength training. Mm. Like we, we, we're all, we all, again, we, everyone wants to be, you know, like uh, mechanics where we plug that thing into the car and find out exactly what's wrong with it. But it doesn't, it's too, it's too complicated. It's like, we're trying to create a tornado and I don't know how, <laughs> again, I know that's just complex. It's like a butterfly somewhere. I don't know. What's that? that theory. <laughs> butterfly. That's more of what we do. I think. <laughs> I don't want to get into chaos theory, but no, let's, let's yeah, <laughs> we'll stick we'll stick to pain, all right? Yeah. Because we can keep talking for hours on this, I imagine. I, what, okay, so we've we've started out that potentially you've always been woke, as it were, into the multi-dimensional uh-huh. nature of pain. So, can you for for everybody out there potentially? what is your current interpretation of pain? Do you define it in a certain way? Do you have a model <laughs> that you kind of defer to? I know it's semantics with uh, definitions that are pretty fucking frustrating, but what's your TED talk on pain? No, I, I, uh, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a simpleton. I, I don't like all the discussions that people have. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think it helps anything. Hmm. Like the... So if someone says they hurt, that's all I need to know is that something yeah. hurts. There, that that's that's pain and it's bothering them. Let's. What let's about help. in your head though? What? No, no that's it. <laughs> I, yeah, you've got I a just, whole handbook on it, Greg. So surely you've got some insight. So I, I like in terms of definition, but uh, and in in terms of like what I tend to focus on is just solutions. That's that's what I'm I'm more in into. Right. What's uh, and the only reason I want to understand, like I would recommend people understand pain or go into the details of like what what drives pain and sensitivity, is that it often helps people make better choices. Right. As soon as people can realize pain is more than just their knee caving in when they walk or when they squat, like 
and that no you you're safe to start walking again who cares if your knee caves in like that that's a huge messaging so my my messaging is really simple in the book it's like pain is more about sensitivity than damage you can have all these things that are messed up with you and none of them have to change to get better like that like i think you you can spin the complexity of pain which is like look at all these things that in, that can influence pain and be like oh no i'm messed up i have all these things wrong with me but the optimistic spin is like look at all these things that can influence pain so that means i have lots of options on how to get better so that that's how i tend to look at pain is like more pragmatically rather than the yeah. academic discussions yeah that, that for sure and how would you and how would you describe it to other clinicians for example or up and coming new graduates who potentially have just been exposed to a nociceptive model of of pain is there uh, is there a simple way in which you could sort of get them to shift their understanding of it sure i'd be like think of a cake that you had recently and ask them what's your favorite ingredient in that cake <laughs> like what <laughs> you know what i mean like you can't taste the sugar or the flour or the egg but they all went in there and that's sort of the, the that's how pain works you have all of these factors that influence and influence it and then it, it like you said it emerges it's greater than the the sum of it its parts mm. right and so it's, it's a homogenous kind of uh mixture that is inseparable all its constituent components aren't separable from each other yeah yeah and uh or you can look at it like a chemical equation if that's their their background like it it's it's it, if pain is multifactorial it doesn't mean it's additive you know it's just like add add and boom suddenly a pain you can have one little change and you can have a massive massive change in the pain that that we have so it's mm. you know it's it's exponential sometimes right you just you don't sleep yep. well you're stressed about something you run mm. a little bit more than usual and just boom mm. you're set off and then then we get into a cycle i i guess i do use the word overprotection when it comes to pain or protection if you when you when we seem to keep having pain i like to view it as like you're you're helping yourself too much <laughs> yeah no, i think oh i think i got a little sentence from your your handbook just when i was looking through it before it's it pain prompts action it, it sort of it stimulates the person who has experienced it to do something could you speak yeah. to that a little bit so that i mean that's a lorem or mostly david butler thing but i'm sure other, actually maybe i didn't hear it for them cuz I, I actually was only introduced to lorem or mostly like 10 years ago mm. i didn't know his stuff before I'm, i'm kind of embarrassed about that he wasn't one of my original uh, teachers but that, that that's more of uh, their idea like we pain is an alarm that wants to get you to do to do something right and the problem with the alarms is you know they they can't tell you how big the fire is they can't tell you if there is a fire they can't tell you how much smoke it's just just triggered and then the other issue with alarms or with pain is uh after a while whatever the initial cause was that can be gone and the alarms just going off so and 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 then when it comes to alarms or like the protection idea they can be more easily triggered we just become more sensitive that's and that's what sucks there's there's not a lot of wisdom in in alarm sometimes it's absolutely accurate <laughs> but sometimes it's it's not yeah alarm has been a big influence in my career and in all australian physios obviously and um we sort of grew, grew up with his model and it's interesting to there's there is some work out there actually looking at pain as an alarm and and prompts protective action and safety seeking behavior and all and all these sorts of things and it's it, you sort of explain it quite nicely in in your handbook where and I don't know if this is exact is exactly what you say but the argument is that pain as an alarm from an evolutionary perspective is going to go off more often than it should because the cost of not going off at all would be catastrophic for the organism right so yeah. it'll go off to alert you to something and then you we can cognitively reappraise it if, if we need to but that alarm going off doesn't always mean that there's something sinister or pathological going on yeah and i would even run with that more cuz that seems illogical to a lot of people with pain 
And I would say that's the default for a lot of human function is that we overdo these protective responses. So again, like my third favorite thing in my course, <laughs> no, it's my, my third, my third most favorite thing. It's my favorite one is, uh, it's really fun to have people say, okay, think of all the times where you overprotect. And then people can't think of any, and then you start pulling them out. And it's amazing how many times the body isn't that wise. Like anxiety is a great example when people have like a panic attack. It's normal to have anxiety. You should be worried about a number of things, but we overdo it. If you, um, if you break a bone, you normally produce more bone. If you get hit in the quad with a baseball, some of us will have myositis ossificans, right? It's, it's overhealing. Uh, scar tissue or like keloids when you when you get burnt you know we all like uh, autoimmune diseases like we want to have an immune system but sometimes we overdo shit right that that that's the the problem so it's it's not weird that we overdo pain if you actually frame it in that model and then you can start finding out all of these examples where where we overdo it and you're like shit that's just what humans do yeah and that that kind of gets to a whole nother perhaps persistent pain and whatever you want to call it is a simple epiphenomenon or byproduct of of the human pain experience and whether we can actually truly change it manifestly in society at a at large scale i don't know is that is that is that something yeah. that is a worthy of course it's worthy but is it realistic it's i think i think what you're asking there uh is maybe like how much do our beliefs really drive this overprotective response? Mm. Uh, and I think that they do in some people, but I think there's a lot of people, if you, if you told them that they had scar tissue and they have faulty biomechanics, you said all the negative things to them and their x-rays were horrible, they'd still do fine. But I think there's a subset of people who really respond negatively to, yeah. to, to um, what they've been told. So I don't know if that'd be like the best use of money of public funds. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it, it just, it just, there's some people who, I don't, this is, this is not proven, this is conceptual and there's some work on it that, who have just this phenotype that is, is when something happens at some point, there's a nociceptive event or a pain event or something that all of these, the factors that are intrinsic to them as human beings will cause pain to stick around longer than somebody else who has a different phenotype. So how, I, I, I am sort of cautious and a little bit cynical on how much we can materially change somebody's phenotype from that perspective. And we, there's not much work done on how we can change expectations or self-efficacy. Or, or these sorts of things. We know they predict outcomes, but can we change that expectation to change an outcome? That's not really been studied as far as I'm aware. No, I've, I've read the, some negative stuff about changing self-efficacy, where it's hard to, very hard to change in, yeah. in some people. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm, not sure. I'm not sure if you can change other things that, like, that would help you cope with low self-efficacy. Mm. Uh, uh, but so, so I, I don't know. That's, that's one of the things, the, the only thing I, I do think about, uh, with people like that, like, yes, some people are definitely more predisposed to pain. Uh, but there was a time in their life when they didn't have pain. Mm. So that always gives me some hope, you know, and they probably had these same traits of low self-efficacy or whatever. So what was it that changed? Like, how can we get them back to the, the way they were before when they, they were doing okay? Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. And I, I tend to say that if somebody's come in, the pain has just gotten stuck for a period of time. It's, it's, it's an alarm to use your analogy and, and others that it's just gone off. And maybe we can diminish the sound by a decibel or two until ultimately it, it goes away to a manageable level where you can return yeah to meaningful activity. I think that's a nice way to look at it. Yeah, I like it too. And that's why, I mean, if I were to take another course, I, I'm, I'd be interested in taking like the ACT courses on pain, the acceptance yeah. and commitment. That, that's that idea where you, you can cope 
with these things, like using the anxiety model. It's really unfair to someone who has anxiety to say, we're just going to get rid of all your anxiety. That's, that's, that's not happening. It's how you cope with those, those thoughts. You know, like my, my middle daughter has that stuff where she'll just have um, these thoughts that, that really get in the way. Like she, she, she the other, last night she said, when I have a shower, I have to make sure I have this thought where I have to make sure I get water or water in my eyes. Cause then if I don't, when I go to sleep, then I'll die. <laughs> I'm like, all right, buddy. So, what are you gonna do with that? And so we, she has these all the time. These, these ideas where she was really upset. It was her, her older sister' birthday, her birthday the other day, and she came in. She's like, I, I, it's it's the end of the night. They sleep in the same bed, and she's like, uh, can I? I told, I'm not sure. I told Violet happy birthday properly. I'm like, you told her, well, yeah, but I don't know if I did it right. Now I keep have, feeling like I have to tell her happy birthday. Well, how many? How, how many times have you done in the past hours? Like, like 10 times, but I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyways, uh, uh, like things like that, we're not going to cure her of this, right? That's her trait since she's like a little kid, right? So, so it, it, it's coping and managing with that. And that's the idea. I think sometimes with pain, you can, you can have pain, but you can help with the suffering and the disability would be the idea. I yeah. think we could learn a lot as physios from the anxiety model because then i think often you do a mechanical intervention like you do physio stuff you just have like a process of maybe prescribing exercises or movements and explaining it that kind of uses this anxiety model i think that's where we we can evolve and get better including me uh, that that's really well articulated in that it's that and, and perhaps uh, Bronnie Thompson's actually done a paper on living well with pain and the, she's, she's found, you know, certain traits or certain activities that people do who have chronic pain, but have less disability and suffering, yeah. suffering associated with the pain. And it's essentially meaningful activity and intentional activity and support and all these sorts of things, which is... Has she published a paper or is that... Um, yeah, yeah. She did a, a, she did a PhD. She did a PhD in it. I'll... Um, I'll send you a, send you a paper if you like, and it's uh, yeah, really yeah. fascinating. No, she's I, got I, chronic pain herself, and it's um it's quite interesting. Ah, uh, she just says she does, so it makes her look better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, Brownie. Look, I know where you're coming from. I've, I've got pain too. Yeah, I'll say that all the time. <laughs> yeah. No, I uh, I refer people to her website all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's great. And I say the exact same thing that you said. <laughs> she's got a PhD in fibro, and she has it. <laughs> she must know what she's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, but um, no, that's well. On that anxiety model, so we're kind of this is leading nicely into graded exposure because uh, the, the best treatment for anxiety is is graded exposure, uh, as far as I yeah. can see, anyway, in terms of the psychological literature, and, and it's making a huge come. I don't know if it's making a comeback, but it's making a move in in physiotherapy circles from the past ten years or so, which is probably a good thing. So graded exposure very simple when you think about it it's just gradually exposing people to previously painful movements um, in a systematic and, and regimented way probably in the clinical context where they're feeling safe and there's an expert watching on um, so so would you say that this, this graded exposure type of in, intervention in conjunction with explained pain type of stuff as well and and when I say explained pain I'm not talking about deep neuroscience uh, yeah education. you think that's where we're heading uh i mean i it's certainly how i practice i either do graded exposure or graded activity um sometimes like with the graded exposure like with the valean model there they so the way they do it in cft like cognitive functional therapy they they do it very similarly as well and they call like they've they've done the process for over a decade but now they've adopted what seems like the psychological language behind it. Like they talk about these move, like behavioral experiments where you find yeah. a feared or avoided activity, you start to do it and you have movement modifiers. And what they would say is, is that they're not adding things, they're removing safety behaviors. So that 
So someone else might add bracing when you lift something up to make it feel better. What they would do is remove the bracing or remove it. So someone would say, oh, you're just adding looseness. And they're like, no, we're not adding fluidity. We're removing stiffness. <laughs> and, that's, and that's important because that, that's the idea of like, when you do an exposure, you have to take away the safety behavior. You have to you, use, like people think that they can only do it one way. And so they need these safety behaviors. And the argument is those safety behaviors are driving the pain and the fear. They, they might have been helpful before, but now they're linked, they're associated you know, with, with, with the pain phenomenon. So mm -hmm. you get rid of those, and then you do the task, and either you have less pain, that's ideal, or like you, you do it and you don't suffer the consequences of what you might expect, which would be harm or something like that. Uh, and then it makes the person reevaluate you know, they call it expectancy violation. You have an expectation and you violate that that didn't occur. My issue with it is it's, I don't think you can do it with everyone and dramatically have a change in pain. Like if their expectation is to have pain, sometimes it's okay to do things even when it hurts and that's still a success and that's still great at exposure. If you're always driving, if you're trying to get rid of pain all the time, I think that's a bit of, bit of an issue. I think just... Mm -hmm. Doing the feared or avoided task with pain is still a success. Yeah. Like, I don't think. And that is, yeah. that is, sorry to interrupt, that is the definition of self efficacy the belief or the ability to do something despite your pain or your, your issue at the time. And I think the application of exercise can sort of prompt or can encourage that behavior where, look, I just lifted two kilos, it hurt, but here I am. Yeah. It, you know, I'm not flawed. Yeah. I, I think I'd probably do more of that. Like I'll take, you know, Peter O'Sullivan's and, and, uh, 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 Charton and, and, uh, Kieran O'Sullivan, their courses. And, you know, often people have these dramatic reductions in pain, but so would Mulligan. <laughs> right. And now I know Mulligan practitioners who describe what they're doing as, as, uh, as, kind of graded exposure with violation expectancy. But, but I, do, I don't trust, and it's not O'Sullivan, because why I respect him so much is he never tests himself in his trials. It's always people they train. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't trust the, the theatrics on a stage just because someone got better immediately. There's too many confounders. And I don't think that people should like put that stress on themselves to immediately change symptoms in that one session. Oh, because when you see the CFT protocols, they're usually seen at least 10 times. So you can't do violation expectancy every single session, right? It's, it's their intervention is, is more than that. So mm. I, I think it's more just, you could probably, people will get, do just as well without any of the, uh, they could just do graded activity and healthy activities and better sleep and understanding pain. They do just as well. I don't know if you mm. need that, the graded exposure, the way it's done in the like psychological way. But it is popular now. Well, the CFT one is, is interesting because I think there's three, there's three dimensions. There's the education aspect, there's the guided behavioral experiments, and then there's the lifestyle advice, which yeah. I think is a really important dimension that a lot of physios, does, this is mental, but we don't look at it. We don't look at, we don't encourage the physic, regular physical activity. It, it's crazy, but we don't. We, don't. we don't look at other habits that people have in their lifestyle as well smoking for example all of these sorts of things so that i think that's a really important dimension to add as well because you can do the best bloody graded exposure that, that you like but if they've got all these other bad habits in their life potentially it's going to come back yeah well let me tell you one of my favorite questions from my course <laughs> <laughs> this is the highlights of the greg layman course no because what i love doing in my class is like asking everyone the questions that I struggle with. <laughs> and then I incorporated it into the course and pretended I came up with it. But like when I would read the psychological literature and definitely after taking the CFT course, I'd be like, oh, like I don't effing know what has to change when it comes to like all of these multidimensional factors. There would be those spider plots where you try to guess how much I'm like, I can't do this. And I was like, fuck that. And I, so what, what I say to all my patients and what I, and what I have people do in the course is just say, Hey, everyone, tell me all the things that you can do to be healthier. 
So we, we split into groups, everyone does it, they come up with 20 things. And then we look at them on the board and I'm like, are all of these things linked with pain? <laughs> and yes, they are. So what does that mean you could work on with all of your patients, right? It doesn't mean you're gonna do all of them, but you're gonna like recommend that maybe they know, go, go see someone else. Or you ask your patient, okay, what do you wanna work on? You know, these are the things, these are the things I can help you with. But if you want to work on these other things, well, let's get someone else involved. Yeah, so that, that's how I deal with the like complexity of pain is ask that question. And then you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I, I, I see how pain is multifactorial. It doesn't mean I fix their depression. Yeah, acknowledge that's, it. that's beautifully said. So it's, yeah. it's, you've, you've, you've nailed it. I think um, that's, that's that's a really that's a really important point. So so let's let's if we can maybe have a bit of a practical example. Say for you you're interested in in running. I I think so. Knee pain. Somebody comes in. They've got anterior knee pain. It's developed over a period of of, of weeks to months on the background of increasing activity. They're training for something. There's a bunch of other risk factors there. So potentially. Um, there is some underlying depressive or anxiety symptoms. There might be some sleeping issues. There might be some, some weight issues. They might not be doing any strength and conditioning. I know I'm making this quite difficult. So where, where would you start there? So and I, know, I know that everybody's different, but if you could hypothesize and you could just, if there's somebody that comes to the front of your mind that you've seen similar to this, like wh where, do you, uh, where do you go there? Oh, yeah. So, I mean... Um... So I work with all kinds of runners and some are ridiculous, like running 200 kilometers per week and stuff like that and fast marathoners. Um, but I always start with, with um, ruling out sinister pathology. That's always number one, be a good clinician first. And, and with a runner, especially a female, you want to rule out like stress fractures. That, those are the things that you're worried about. And then even that stratify it like, you don't like a femoral neck, neck stress fracture is more concerning than a fibula stress fracture. So if, if you have any suspicion, then you got to say, we got to shut it down or something like that. So that, that, that's the, the first step there is like, make sure it's just a pain injury or whatever sensitivity problem. Uh, and then you're like, okay, well, how, Again, I'm crude here, but how can we calm stuff down and build that person back up, right? And there you're trying to think like, what are all the sensitizers in their life that we could change right now? What are the ones where we just acknowledge that might help them understand their pain? Uh, and then often pragmatically, you're, you're usually changing something about their training. That's usually the first, let's change something. Maybe we drop a speed session for two weeks. Maybe instead of just, if they're running a lot more than usual, we would say, let's try running twice a day instead of one long session in the morning. You're just trying to play with their training and the stressors. And then again, look at all the other stressors. If, if, if they're building a house and they're renovating it, then they probably can't always train through that. Something has to change. So like give them some, you know, permission sort of to be flexible so i look at the big things like like that first mm. and then you might start talking about adding a little bit of strength training or something like that but usually it's changing the stressors on, on them in the, the, the big areas so you could could you walk away from a consultation like that and even though even if you see them a, a few times over a period of weeks or months you could just simply modify a variable in their training program or in their lifestyle without implementing a strength and conditioning regime? I mean, I, so though I practice very comprehensively because I understand that I don't know what has to be done. So usually everyone gets a three exercises because that's, that's what they can do. So, um, and, but I, I would always wonder, do I even need those things? That, that's the question. So like, to, it, cause often the athletes I'm working with are, have worked with a coach. So I know they've already been managed well in the load management area. 
So that's why I'm probably giving more um, exercise. But some people who aren't working with a coach and they don't do a lot of mileage or they're just building up their mileage, then I think it's more of a mileage, like load thing. Um, but honestly, like the past five athletes in the past two weeks or so, very elite runners, it's, they've already pulled back all their, all their mileage and, and they all have tendon problems. So when we talk about when you have to be specific, that's where I'm giving exercises and I'm just loading yeah. them up. But yeah, cause the, my, the concept there is we can't, you've already changed the loads. Well, and you should be able to adapt to them, but you're not. So how about we build up a tolerance to increase your ability to adapt or how about we, you know, cause some adaptation so that you can tolerate the running stressors. That's the mindset there. Yeah. Cool. So if, if the modification of a variable doesn't seem like it's doing something or it's already been done or somebody else has attempted to play with it, then you can try and change their capacity or change their system somehow to build it up to match the demand they want to put through it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just don't use the word capacity. I mean, I would have used it 15 years ago. That's an old yeah. like model, although it's very popular now. I just think um, it's missing something i think it's not capacity like exercise we, that assumes that we know the mechanism of what exercise is doing i don't know if it's building capacity or just changing sensitivity mm. like something so but but yeah, i get that the, the, yeah, yeah the way capacity from my which jill cook and all that sort of talk about is it's just doing something without aggravating symptoms or injury sure. occurring. i think it's meant to just be abroad i, I like it I, I don't i don't care i think it's better than using strength which is often what's used around, you know, you've got to build strength in your shoulder. I think that, I think a patient can mis misinterpret that quite quickly. And especially strong people who come in, I get a lot of bodybuilders and, and heavy lifters coming in like, mate, I can bench 200 kilos. What are you talking about? So it's, it's different from that perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, if it's used generically, like I use the term comprehensive capacity and I mean it as like, generic as it can get <laughs> as you can get like it's not specific at all yeah. i've just heard it used when people talk about load it's like it seems it seems a little like a little too physical anyways that's you know, too academic yeah loads another interesting one um when you talk about load and i think it's really helpful to define all these terms especially for for young new graduates as well load resilience capacity tolerance all of these things Nobody really knows what they mean. And when you talk about load, you've got to, def you've got to, you've got to separate into external load and, and internal load. And the internal load is the thing that I think is always forgotten about, which is the response to an external demand. And, and that's, right. that's, you can't have one without the other. No. And so the, like pragmatically, again, you, what are we doing? Are we changing life's loads? Or are we changing our response? You know, and you can use that, I think, at a, at a more mechanistic level. Like, there's an argument, we always have nociception. We always have that tissue irritation, but it's what we do with it that leads to pain. Mm -hmm. so, so, and that, that might be what happens with tendinopathy. We don't actually change the capacity of the tendon. <laughs> we, there's always, there's tendon out there. Some, some, some things change in the tendon. There's nociception, but exercise might change our response to that to that nociception at the spinal cord or the level of the brain mm -hmm. and that's why i'm so like jill cook is so adamant like it you need to build the tendon and the whole system to tolerate that and like don't ever stretch and manual therapy sucks and that is like <laughs> <laughs> you can only be so certain when you know the fucking mechanism of what's happening and we don't. So you, I can't throw any treatment under the bus so readily, right? I bet there's a massive number of people with tendinosis and tendinopathy who will respond better to manual therapy than they will to a graduated loading program because there's nothing wrong with the quality of their tendon or their muscles. There's some just goddamn sensitivity issue. Right. That's what, because if we know people can have tendinosis and have pain, then why do I need to build up the tendon around it? Yeah. How do I know it's not just a fucking nervous system thing? Yeah. So I can't, 100%. I just can't throw shade. I can't be so mm. like, and I was before a, a little too strident and like, that's bullshit. And I think that 
if once you understand the complexity of pain, then you should be open to how other things could be helpful, or at least be open to knowing that you don't know everything. That is, I totally agree there. It's, um, it, it's, again, it's cognitive dissonance. If you're going to say pain is complicated, but then say, but this is how you have to do it. Yeah. Not fair. <laughs> they don't agree with each other. It's, um, I think, in fairness to Jill, uh, some of her students, so Ebony Rio, and Sean Docking, they've published on lo the local effects of loading and capacity and then the system or organism capacity kind of issue as well. Because then it's, they look at the tendon capacity and then they look at the sensitivity mm -hmm. or, or um, general person levels as well. So, so some of her students have gone on to further. Oh, so is Jill. I mean, they're, but all of them are great. She, she's fantastic. She's pushed the needle the, the, the right way. I'm just like, hesitant when people are like seven things not to do and then <laughs> and then we all pretend like we're evidence-based and you're like where's the research like yeah. everyone's like don't like don't stretch your ITB or stretch your Achilles and you're like where is the study that compared a stretching protocol with a loading protocol it doesn't exist like if you want you could go there's a few papers where they just stretch the Achilles and people get better yeah I mean, even, uh, I always forget his name. He's, he's, he's down there by you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he's an interesting person to talk to. He, he did an Achilles, he's a sports medicine doctor. And a decade ago, he did an Achilles lo loading program with stretching in it. He held it okay. like it was stretching based. It was an mm. Achilles, eccentric loading, but they're doing higher than 15 reps and then holding it for 30 seconds. He's getting comparable results to everybody else. Uh, what the hell is his name, yeah. man? Uh, sports med. Ooh, so he's, he's a sports doctor, is he? Yeah. He okay. always argues with Jill Cook. It's hilarious. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I, I used to be in the UK and I uh, did a bit of work with um, Alfredson and okay. uh, the eccentric guy. And um, that was a fascinating conversation because he clearly still into eccentric loading and then he does a lot of this debridement surgery yeah. of, the, of the achilles now with very good outcomes now this, mm -hmm. he honestly and it, this might be too much but he has like 95 percent um success rate in terms of his achilles debridement surgery so you know that yeah. speaks to an element of adhesions or whatever you want to talk about between the paratendon and the tendon so it's not a slam dunk with loading and, and tendinopathy. Well, well, look at, so people, people say, oh, you, uh, stretching's useless or, or endurance exercises are useless because it, it won't change the stiffness of the Achilles tendon. The Achilles tendon, you know, has to undergo, you know, four and a half percent strain to adapt. That's about 70% max exercise, which is, you know, 12 reps. Mm. Uh, so you have to train heavy. And yet, the Alfredson eccentric program is 15 reps. It's about 63% of your max, and it's comparable to doing a heavy resistance training. So the most famous program that seems to help lots of people that won't even change the tendon quality. So how important is building up the tendon quality when someone has tendinopathy? Yeah. If, if doing it, or like hopping. Hopping is great. Of course, I would have all my patients with Achilles tendinopathy get into hopping if they need to. But at the same time, I know that hopping is not going to change the quality of the tendon. Mm. It's not consistently. It'll do mm. something else. So then what's driving your treatment? You're just, what I think you're saying is, what does this person have to do? Okay, let's do that. <laughs> well, no <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? It's, it's a bit deflating. <laughs> when you can talk about all of this stuff and then you're like, ah, just, just do what you want to do, but back it off a fraction. Back it off. And then like, or, or you, or you, you break it down and you just do, you do more in the gym than what you're going to do outside. Yeah. So the gym prepares you. So what's outside is easy. That's, that's the simple way to look at it. Give yourself a buffer for the, for the real world, right? Like yeah. you know, capacity here, capacity. Sorry. I know you don't like that term. And then your requirements here, right? Give yourself a bit of leeway. 
I think I don't like it because it's too much like me. It's like uh, I've been saying it and then I just, something has changed in me where I'm like, there's something wrong about that. I'm tired of hearing it all the time. I can't quite put my finger on it yet, but I don't know what. Probably because everybody else is using it now, Greg. I you think know, that's you, a lot. You do like to be contrary. <laughs> Honestly, like the, the capacity model where people always quote uh, Scott Die from like two, oh, the, the 2000s. Yeah, that yeah. That shit, that was Stu McGill in 1996. The same yeah. thing. He's like, here's the loads. Here's your tolerance. Just don't have the load. Go above your tolerance. Yeah. And everyone like quote that guy. That was 25 years ago. Get the, the envelope quote. of function. Yeah, I can't yeah. believe. It's, Pre it's so simple. Everyone loves it like. It was preceded by so many other people, yet that's the one that gets popular. That's what yeah, me, isn't, isn't that funny? It's the same thing with, um, with progressive loading, right? And uh, acute chronic workload ratios and all these oh, sorts fuck. of things. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's funny because that's starting to be quite uh, challenged now by, by an Australian guy, Franco in Franco, yeah. And they've, yeah and they've, um, anyway. So what, well, uh, no, I've talked a lot about that at, with Franco. He always direct message, messages me because he knows that oh, I'm good, an yeah. ally. Well, what we have an issue with is we don't question the concept of, which is don't do too much too soon. No shit. We've been saying, that's what bu has always bugged me about the acute to chronic mm -hmm. workload ratio. Like there's nothing new in it. You just reframed it differently. What got popular was that there was, you could actually predict and say, there's a certain amount that you have to stay under. There's a certain Wait, envelope. Stop. Yeah. And that's what Franco said. No, there's not. That, that research hasn't been shown. So the research really hasn't helped anyone beyond just saying, don't do too much too soon another way. It's not actionable yet. The concept seems great, but right now, pragmatically, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Arguably, I, did, I, I do think it brought it to sort of right. mainstream attention. And now you've got LeBron James doing load management. Which is insane to me that it had to happen. Like, yeah. I, I guess I've just worked with running coaches for 20 years or, or actually hockey coaches and basketball coaches because I used to be a strength coach. And uh, they all thought of that stuff. I always thought that coaches were the first biopsychosocialists. <laughs> right? If you're working with high school kids or college kids and you hear that one guy's going through a breakup or stressful time with school, good coaches like back the training off or they figure out a way for him or her to adapt. Like I wrote an article years ago saying that was my thesis that coaches were the first biopsychosocialists or at least good ones were. Yeah. And that, that's mate, that is, that's a really good way to, uh, to round off this conversation. I think that's what we should be, right? We should be a coach. We're coaching yep. somebody back to health. And so we need to consider the full aspect of the human condition, which is a, which is a nightmare sometimes and it's not what we're trained for. And that is my biggest bugbear because I was so awkward discussing many, di I, I didn't even ask the question, I, is there something going on in your life? Because I don't know what to do with the answer. Um, but I think that's something we should be much more comfortable in discussing, even if we're not going to intervene and treat, which we should not that aspect, then we refer on. Yeah, co-manage. Epic. All right. Um, just to just to finish off, we've, we've covered a lot of territory, uh, which is which is what I knew I was getting into when I was going to chat to you. So that, um, hopefully people get the value out of it. So, uh, what what do you like to do for a bit of fun, Greg? I see you on Instagram doing some tumbling around, and uh, I know you've got uh, a young family. So what what's meaningful for you? Uh, I do a lot of trampoline right now. Um, what got you and into that? I would rock climb. What's that? What got you into the, the, the trampoline and tumbling? Um, so when I was a teenager, I just, I taught trampoline, but at like a really low level, I picked it up when I was older. I couldn't do anything. And then my girls started cheerleading. So I used to go in their classes for tumbling. Yeah, that was awesome. three years ago. And then I just started going on my own. And when the gyms are open, I'd go two or three times a week. But we have a trampoline in our backyard, a tumble track. It's like a bouncy thing to tumble on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I how's do. it going? You getting better? How's the, how's the old body going? Uh, I mean, there'll be more stuff on the trampoline. I can't tumbling on the ground. It's hard. Like you have to, in order to get better, you have to put in the work, but it's so much work. It's beyond what I can tolerate. So I was pretty achy when I was trying to do stuff on the ground. So it's a trade off there. 
that's hard. Yeah, but, but trampoline, yeah. like I'll, I'll be able to do it. Like I just did a double backflip before COVID. That was huge. Yeah. So that's you can perfect. do that stuff. You can progress that. You can do that until you're 80 or more. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And um, are you any injuries out of it so far? Anything? Any acute chronic workload issues, mate? There, there, there was like two years ago when I was trying to get like back handsprings and backflips on the floor. That had trained so much, so my wrists were sore for a long time. They still are, but because I, I was doing four to five days a week, but I had to do that or I wouldn't get better. So, and I knew that, yeah. so it was just a trade-off. Mm. <laughs> isn't it isn't that funny trying to i listen i can't listen to my own advice when i'm when i'm doing i like to do some weights and i like to surf and then when the surf's good i go out for three hours because it's pumping and i haven't surfed for six weeks i'm like but you, you can't not i just have to do it right and then the next morning is a disaster and i can't go out if i should just did two one and a half hour sessions it would have been way better yeah <laughs> anyway um thanks for having a chat with me mate Where, so what, what's the best platform for people to get you on is it twitter what's what's your preferred platform yeah probably twitter yeah twitter. And your what, what's your handle there it's just greg layman greg layman well there you go mate thanks for having a chat with me buddy uh we'll catch up soon all right thank you